we're talking about Project 2025 on one of my posts, and we are marching that way. We we warned everybody that it was coming, but it's finally here. Um, Republicans can take the mask off and stop acting like they're not trying to enact Project 2025. Arctic Prowl is wondering what will happen with single moms under Project 2025. Me, I'm being snarky here. Single moms aren't valid. Get a husband and don't leave him. And y'all know that that is where it's going because the only valid family structures these Christian, these Christo fascists believe in is a straight couple, mother and father in the home, no matter how the woman is being treated, the children are being treated, no worries. You stick and stay with that man. And like Akina said, ah, the same thinking they had before, no fault divorce. And ironically, let, let's just throw it out there, around the same time, husbands were dying due to mysterious illnesses. So just keep that in mind that, yes, before no-fault divorces, some people were mysteriously dying. I do want to talk about a part of Project 2025. We've talked about it before, but we need to talk about it more. This is in the Department of Health and Human Services section. This is literally in Project 2025. If the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, were a separate country, its approximately $1.6 trillion budget would rank as the world's fifth largest national budget. For good or ill, HHS activities personally impact the lives of more Americans than do those of any other federal budget. Under President Trump, HHS was dedicated to serving all Americans from conception to natural death, including those individuals and families who face economic and social well-being challenges. Under President Biden, the mission has shifted to promoting equity in everything we do for the sake of populations sharing particular characteristics, including race, sexuality, gender identification, ethnicity, and a host of other categories. As a result of HHS's having lost its way, U.S. life expectancy, instead of returning to normal after the COVID-19 pandemic, continued to drop precipitously to levels not seen since 1996 with white populations, white populations, white populations alone losing 7% of their expected lifespan in just one year. Nothing less than America's long-term survival is at stake. <laughs> All right. According to H H accordingly, HHS must return to serving the health and well-being of all Americans at all stages of life, especially white Americans, um, instead of using social engineering that leaves us sicker, poor, and more divided. You know, <laughs> Biden's out here serving populations based on race, sexuality, gender identification, ethnicity, and a host of other categories when they really should just be focusing on, what is this, white Americans. Okay, cool, cool. I want to skip to their goal number three, promoting stable and flourishing married families. Families comp comprised of a married mother, father, and their children are the foundation of a well-ordered nation and healthy society. Unfortunately, family policies and programs under Biden's HHS are fraught with agenda items focusing on LGBTQ inequity, subsidizing single motherhood, disincentivizing work, and penalizing marriage. These policies should be repealed and replaced by policies that support the formation of stable married nuclear families. Working fathers are essential to the well-being and development of children, but the United States is experiencing a crisis of fatherlessness that is ruining our children's futures. In the overwhelming number of cases, fathers insulate children from physical and SA, financial difficulty or poverty, incarceration, teen pregnancy, poor educational outcomes, high school failure, and a host of behavioral and psychological problems. By contrast, homes with non-related boyfriends present are among the most dangerous place for a child to be. HHS should prioritize married father engagement in its messaging, health, and welfare um, policies. In the context of current and emergency reproductive technologies, HHS should never place the desires of adults over the right of children to be raised by the biological fathers and mothers who conceive them. In cases involving biological parents who are found by a court to be unfit because of abuse or neglect, 
the process of adoption should be speedy, certain, and supported generously by HHS. I am unsure where single mothers or members of the LGBTQ who have children, where y'all fall with things, but apparently you are not part of goal number three, which is a promoting st um, the stable, flourishing married family. Sorry, you have to be married in order to be considered a family under Project 2025. So please get married, get straight married only, and stay straight married. <laughs> Y'all, I'm being snarky. Please know and understand that I do, I understand that families can be made up of many different types of people. So, but this is what Project 2025 is. And for all of the, the, the gay people for Trump and all that, your families are not valid. The single mothers who, you know, might have tried marriage and now you're divorced, you are no longer valid. Your family is invalid. All right. I just wanted to pull that out and let you all know, get married, stay married, no matter what. <laughs> but for real, but for real, but for real. If you are in a bad situation, you better get divorced right now before they take no fault divorce off the table. Let me know what you think of this. Okay, so we are marching towards The Handmaid's Tale with Project 2025. Yay. So Trump's transition team turns to Project 2025 after disavowing it during the campaign because some people really believed him and when he said that he didn't know anything about it. <laughs> oh, some people really believe a liar and that's wild to me. President-elect Donald Trump and his allies disavowed the conservative Project 2025 during the election seeing the conservative transition plan and policy blueprint as a liability after Democrats used it to attack his campaign. Some close to Trump even suggested those tied to the effort would be shut out of a potential administration. They made themselves nuclear. Um, Howard Lutnick, the co-chair of Trump's transition and his nominee to serve as Commerce Secretary, told CNBC in September. But with the campaign over, Trump's transition team is turning into Project 2025 to help staff the next administration. Already, transition officials are taking suggestions for potential hires from the extensive personnel database created by Project 2025, a, per a person familiar with the situation told NBC News. While Project 2025's massive book of conservative policy recommendations received most of the attention from Democrats, a central part of the effort was putting together a database that officials had framed as a conservative LinkedIn to help staff an incoming Republican administration. The person familiar with the transition said officials overseeing plans for some departments and agencies have started to reach out to potential hires whose names and contact information were part of that database. Individuals helping to fill out the personnel team for tr the Trump transition operation have sought and used information from the Project 2025 database because of the enormity of the task of filling out more than 4,000 political appointee jobs that will become vacant in 2025, this person said. That's a lot of positions to fill, and we continue to send names over, including ones from the database, as they are conservative, qualified, and vetted. The person who worked on Project 2025 said, Hard to find 4,000 solid people, so we are happy to help. The receptiveness to using the Project 2025 database for potential hires comes as the transition has already shown it is open to tapping contributors to the effort for administration jobs, including Tom Homan as border czar, Brendan Carr as chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, and John Ratcliffe as CIA director. Both Homan and Ratcliffe were listed as contributors to Project 2025, while Carr wrote, chapter, wrote a chapter on the FCC. Additionally, former Office of Management and Budget Director Russ Voigt, a Project 2025 author, who also served as the Republican National Committee's Platform Policy Director, is thought of as a potential administration pick too, but not everyone is being welcomed aboard. Politico reported Thursday that a transition rejected a push for former Trump administration official Roger Servino, who wrote Project 2025 chapter on the Department of Health and Human Services to serve as the deputy secretary of the agency, over concerned about the anti-abortion policies he laid out in the policy blueprint. The personnel database was a cornerstone of Project 2025. Under Paul Dans, a former Trump administration official who led the Project 2025, the group 
The group built a database of more than 10,000 candidates vetted for the MAGA, for their MAGA credentials, who would build out the administration in the event that Trump won, as ProPublica reported in August. The idea behind the effort was to ensure that a future Trump administration would have the foot soldiers necessary to rapidly enact his agenda upon taking office. Please know and understand that this is coming, so you might as well brace yourself. And if you were foolish enough to believe that he didn't know anything about this, please explain why. This man has lied at every avenue, at every turn, anytime his mouth is open. So why did people believe that he didn't know what was going on with this? So get ready for the Handmaid's Tale slash Project 2025 and a theocracy as we march towards Christo fascism under his eye. We've been talking about the push to get people back into the office, and it is costly to commute and go into the office, especially for things that can be done at home and the convenience of doing things at home and the ability for people to be able to be caretakers, take care of their children, their their elderly parents, whatever. But they're trying to get everybody back into the workforce, the office, because, you know, you have to buy clothes, you have to spend money on gas, you have to buy more cars or whatever. They're trying to capitalize on all of that. So this was posted, um, this was put in Fortune. Employees are spending the equivalent of a month's groceries on return to office and growing more resentful than ever. This is going to be important because... Elon Musk and um, Vivek Ramaswamy want to make sure all federal employees um, work in an office, not work from home. Um, Obviously, private businesses have been doing this for a while now as well. Okay, let's get into the article. It says, despite the benefits of remote work for employees, many organizations are abandoning it in favor of returning to the office full-time or part-time in a hybrid model. A 2024 survey from Better Up shows the number of primarily remote roles have been cut in half, and one out of every four organizations cite improved connection and culture as the business rationale behind mandated office returns. However, our research found that returning to an office is often a major disruption to one's routine, foundational work, and overall life experience. We surveyed 1,400 full-time U.S. employees who were mandated to return to in-office work, and they found that they had a higher burnout, stress, and turnover intentions. They also had lower trust in their organization, engagement, and productivity levels. Our results indicate that if return to office transition is not handled with high level of humanity, sensitivity, and empathy, workplace culture suffers, and the work, workforce's sense of belonging plummets. We also found that RTO results in pressures on employees' flexibility, time, and even bank accounts. If you are struggling to adjust to a mandated return to office, just know that you are not alone. The main challenges of RTO. There are benefits that come from working in person. For example, Research Better Up has done in partnership with the University of California, Riverside, found increased life satisfaction and social connectedness as benefits of in-person interaction over technology-mediated interaction. While it seems intuitive that people form better working relationships in person, poorly communicated and implemented return-to-office mandates breed resentment towards employers. Resentful employees are less likely to bring their authentic selves to the workplace and less likely to invest in those around them. The most challenging aspect of returning to office is the commute. This isn't surprising because commutes of only 30 minutes are linked to higher stress and anger, while while 45 minutes or more is linked to poor overall well-being, daily mood, and health. What is surprising is the second most challenging aspect of returning to work, the loss of flexibility to switch between work and home tasks for things like accepting a delivery or switching over the laundry between meetings, In a time-starved world, even the smallest time savings can be very important as people attempt to do it all. While some leaders might read this and think, aha, I knew people were multitasking when they should be working, the truth is that remote work is actually a net gain for the organization. Research has found that people in remote work give more total hours to the company. With disruption comes opportunity. 
Evidence from BetterUp suggests agency and choice of work arrangement enables people to find a way of work that can optimize performance and well-being. We also saw that an organization's decision to require in-office work represents a financial burden for employees. The average employee returning to office, returning to the office, spends $561 per month on transportation, additional child and pet care, and domestic domestic assistance. That is comparable to the average person two-person household's grocery bill in the United States for an entire month. It literally costs money to go to work. So what can you do if your employer mandates your return to office? First, focus on maximizing the benefits of this life change, including the opportunity to deepen your relationships and collaborate more with your coworkers. Taking advantage, take advantage of the hybrid work model to connect with people who are physically there as much as possible rather than only logging on to virtual meetings. Second, consider if returning to the office represents an opportunity for better work-life balance. What? Consider if, how would that, con- yeah, okay, let's, let's keep reading. If you are back in the office full time, can you embrace leaving work at work? Okay, that's a good point right there. Can you create desirable new habits or routines like going to the gym on your way in each day? Okay, that's another good point. Shifting back into in-person work is a major systemic disruption, but with that disruption comes the opportunity to design healthier habits. Finally, ask what you um, ask for what you need to thrive while returning to the office. Do you need a late start so you can continue to drop your kids off at school? Do you need better um, commuter benefits to offset financial costs? Do you need a coach to support you as you make the transition back to the office? Thoughtfully raise these needs with your manager. Now, if people are mandated to come into the office, do you think they give a damn about you dropping your kids off? Do you think they give a damn that you're going to be spending more money and you think the office, the employer is going to take that up? (laughs) Those are some good questions, but those seem like some silly questions. Return to office mandates can affect employees and not necessarily in the ways leaders are hoping. If you're in a situation where you're being asked to dramatically shift your way of working, know that it's normal to find this transition difficult, to have a mix of emotions about it, and most importantly, that it's never wrong to ask for what you need. This is going to be challenging because I know some people definitely structured their lives to be able to work, get their kids off to school, take care of their mother, be able to take people to the doctor or whatever. Um, But this is a way to attempt to force women back into the home to make things so difficult or whatever. Plus, if you are um, working from home, it's harder to have your work stolen. So you got to get the people back so that mediocre people can poach your ideas or whatever. Anyways, join the conversation. Let me know what you think about this one. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.